Okay, so last class we talked about the Bohr model. The Bohr model is the beginning of the model that we use today to look at arrangement elect of electrons in the atom, but it's not the complete picture. And there are several reasons for this. Um, since an electron can be a particle or a wave, if it's acting as a wave, it can't be at a fixed distance because waves are not fixed distances. They have amplitude, which means the distance from the nucleus changes. Um, you also can't talk about where an electron is if it's an, a wave because you can't pinpoint an exact location of a wave. Um, also, when we examine the wavelength of the electrons as they're moving, it's about the same size as an atom, which means that each electron acting as a wave is the size of the entire atom, which doesn't really work. So, to get to the current view of the atom that we have now, we need to look in a little further and a little bit more of the physicists that explored this. Um, one of those physicists was Heisenberg, and he came up with the uncertainty principle. And what he said was, we can't know exactly where a moving particle, such at, on, along the size of an electron, not the size of a rock or even a grain of sand, but something along, along the size of an electron, we can't know exactly where that particle is and how fast it's moving at, at the same time. Because when we get down to a level, something that's the size of the electron, we're using photons of light to look at the electron. So this electron acting as a particle moving along, we want to look at it. To look at it, we need to use a photon. Well, the photon is about the same order of magnitude of size as an electron. So the fact that the photon has to hit the electron before we can see it means that the act of looking at the electron causes it to change. So the electron might be going in this direction before we look at it, but once we look at it, now the electron's moving in a different direction. So we had scientists had to give up this idea of knowing exactly where an electron is for the idea that we can predict our, some about where the electron might be. So we look more at probabilities of where we can find an electron and not exact locations for electron arrangement. And the basis of this is something called quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. So Schrodinger is the scientist, the physicist, who came up with these mathematical equations to describe the location of electrons in the atom. Okay. And again, the wave function doesn't tell you where an electron is. What it tells you is where you are most likely to find an electron. So the probability of finding an electron at a given location. So we're looking at probabilities and not exact locations. Okay. So <clears throat> the wave functions for a hydrogen atom or for any other atom have three parameters called quantum numbers. So there are three quantum numbers to describe the location of up to two electrons. So when I have these three, a set of three numbers, I have described something called an atomic orbital. And the atomic orbital is the location, again, of one or two electrons. No more than two, though. So, the three quantum numbers have names and symbols. The first quantum number is called the principal quantum number. Its symbol is n. You can think of this as analogous to Bohr's energy level. Bohr had n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Likewise, um, in the quantum model, we have n values, the lowest value being 1, and their whole number values from there. Then we also have the orbital angular momentum quantum number called L and when I'm writing it myself I'll use a lowercase script L just to differentiate it from one and this is what determines the shape of an orbital. The value of L is determined by the value of N. So the value of L can be any number from 0 to N minus 1. So if we start looking at N values I want to look at the corresponding L values. If n equals 1, L can equal 0, because 1 minus 1 is 0, and that's the smallest possible L value. If n equals 2, L can be 0 or 1. 
So I'm always starting with 0 and working up to the largest number can be n minus 1. If n equals 3, then L can be 0, 1, or 2, and so on and so forth. And as it turns out, these values of L, which are determined from Schrodinger's wave equations or wave functions, um, can be related to the SPDF notation, which we'll talk about in the next video. The SPDF notation came from the study of spectral lines in the mid, eight, mid to late 1800s, well before quantum theory was even an idea. So when quantum theory came along, there was a, a pretty exact correlation between values of L and this SPDF notation. Um, and this is one of the things that supports the idea that the quantum theory really does describe how electrons are located within the atom. So we have L, we have N, principal number, L, which describes the shape of the orbital, which gives me a sublevel. Um, and then we have the magnetic quantum number, M sub L. So <coughs> this determines the orientation of the orbitals. So L determines the shape, M sub L determines the orientation, and also the number of specific orbitals that are available in any specific, specific subshell. So the values of M sub L range from negative L to positive L. So if L equals, excuse me, if L equals zero, M sub L equals zero. If L equals one, then M sub L can equal negative one, zero, or positive one. And you do need to put the plus sign there. And in fact, the number of values for M sub L is 2L plus 1, and that's the number of orbitals in any given subshell. So if we think about this, an S subshell means L equals 0. The number of orbitals is 1. And you should, this is all, that is all covered in first year chemistry, and we'll talk about that again. If you don't really remember all that stuff, we're going to talk about that again in the next video. So if L equals 0, then M sub L equals 0, I have one orbital. If L equals 1, M sub L can be negative 1, 0, or positive 1. So when L equals 1, when I'm in a P sub shell, then I can have three orbitals within that subshell. So let's take a look at how these things kind of come together. So you can see, again, the subshell and orbital designations, we'll be talking about those in the next video. 1s, you have 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, so on and so forth. So this is how <coughs> the quantum numbers tie into the electron configuration world. So you'll notice 1s, the three quantum numbers are 1, 0, 0. That describes a 1s. A 2s is 2, 0, 0. My 2p orbitals all have an n value of 2, an l value of 1, that makes it a p, and then three orbitals, negative 1, 0, positive 1. This chart is also on page 284 in the book. Okay, so let's look at shapes, because we mentioned that the l sub level corresponds to shape. So a 1s orbital, and here's the quantum numbers for 1s orbital, is spherical. So this sphere is a result of graphing the probability based on the wave function. So we kind of make this sphere represent the 90% area. So there's a 90% probability of finding the electron within this area. And this shell, this solid kind of solid looking figure is determined from graphing all the possibilities of the location of a 1s electron and then the boundary represents where 90 percent of the dots fall. So 1s is spherical. A 2s is also spherical but it's bigger than a 1s. So because n equals 2 that means the electrons further away from the nucleus and it has a larger radius. 
So <clears throat> if within the 2s, there is something called a node. And that is an area where the electron cannot exist. And here come, these are some of the weird things about quantum mechanics. An electron can be out here. It can be in here, but it can never be in this boundary between the two. So how it gets from one side to the other, who knows, but it never exists in there. And that's because, again, the electron is a wave, and that means that waves, if we think about a wave, hey, we have the inflection points where we have zero amplitude. So a node is a place of zero amplitude for the wave that is an electron. Okay. When L equals 1, we get P orbitals. So each one of these, this is a picture of them all together, would correspond, maybe this is negative 1, 0, positive 1. So each M sub L value corresponds to, to one of these three P orbitals. Then we get to D, when L equals 2, we have D orbitals. So M sub L could be negative 2, negative 1, 0 positive 1, positive 2. So when we put them all together, we start building something that roughly represents a sphere, and that's kind of where, the, where we get atomic radius from. Okay, there is a fourth quantum number because we want to distinguish individual electrons. So as we go level, sublevel, orbital, any two electrons can have those same three quantum numbers. So I can have two electrons that have a zero, one, a one, zero, zero for the first three quantum numbers. So the fourth quantum number is called the spin quantum number. The spin quantum number can only have two values, plus one half and minus one half, and that represents an electron spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. So with that fourth quantum number, now I have two different electrons. So in my 1s sublevel, I have two electrons total. Each electron has a unique set of four quantum numbers. So that's how I can describe each individual electron by using a set of four quantum numbers. And in the next video, we will look at how this corresponds to the SPDF notation that you learned about in first year chemistry.